since the late 1800s, thousands of Indigenous children from across Canada were forcibly removed from their homes and taken to residential schools. Once there, they were starved, beaten, sexually, verbally, and physically abused. If they tried to run away, they were brought back and punished. In many cases, parents did not even know where their children were. Many children never made it back home. Once they left those institutions, they were not called graduates, but survivors. To mark this special day, during the next half hour, we want to take you on a journey as survivors confront their past in the hopes of finally healing. Canada is facing a reckoning over horrors of the residential school era. The declaration of a national holiday is an end and a beginning for many residential school survivors. The Catholic Church apology is just one step along the way. In March of 2022, more than 200 delegates and 150 media traveled to Rome, Italy for the Walking Together Towards Healing and Reconciliation event. It was a historic meeting between all Indigenous nations from Canada and the Catholic Church. From splashy news conferences to private one-on-one -on -one audiences with Pope Francis, the stakes were high. The first to meet with the Pope was Métis National Council President Cassidy Karen, her executive, and Métis survivors. The time for acknowledgement, apology, and atonement is long overdue. It is never too late to do the right thing. The Métis Nation has already begun the difficult work, but essential work, of hearing the truths that our survivors and their families carry of understanding what substantive justice means to them, and of forging a pathway toward the lasting healing that our entire nation deserves. 85-year-old Angie Creer from Grand Prairie, Alberta, told Pope Francis what happened to her and her younger sisters in 1947 at Fort Resolution Residential School in the Northwest Territories. One thing we have now is our pride. They did not break us. We're still here, and we intend to live here forever. But it is also what is being kept behind these walls that holds the key for those impacted by residential schools. Records, names, dates, and other information about thousands of children who never made it home. As nations embark on their own searches for unmarked graves, these documents will be crucial. Indigenous leaders came to Italy to not only ask for an apology, but to ask the Catholic Church for these records, including the return of ceremonial artifacts that are kept in vaults at the Vatican. That will play an important role in our healing. Will that give us closure? No. National Dene Chief Gerald Antoine is not only a leader of his nation, but He's a residential school survivor, a day school survivor, and was part of the 60s scoop. He says he was first taken to residential school at the age of five years old, but his tradition and culture kept him strong. Now, as a leader of his nation, he went to Rome, Italy to confront the Pope. He says Indian residential schools was a directive given to assimilate indigenous people into white society when the settlers arrived in Canada. And there was also instructions that uh, were also brought along with these ships and these instructions were the ones that were used by the people that came here and these uh, directives that they've uh, came across with are now embedded in the laws and the policies and this policy one of the policies is the indian residential school policy and what chief antoine is referring to is the Doctrine of Discovery, a 1453 document that states that the empires of England, Spain, France and Portugal can colonize countries like Canada. They use the doctrine to justify their goals and approach the Catholic Church for their support. 
Pope Alexander V issued a papal bull stating that indigenous peoples were not human or Christian, and because he said they were not human, they did not have sovereignty over the land. Millions of people were then exterminated, making it a large-scale genocide. Then came in the residential schools, and we know from that uh, point of history, uh, you know, our children were removed uh, with purpose and intent uh, to break down the families and break down our governance and break down our nations. So when the, the children were removed uh, completely from our care, from our families and our nations, uh, they went into these residential schools. And I know personally some of the families that had like say five family members that went and only one that came home. Hereditary Chief Robert Joseph is the Ambassador of Reconciliation Canada and is also a residential school survivor. He says he has seen positive changes starting to happen. We've been a few years past the Truth and Reconciliation Report and there are more Canadians than there have ever been who are now aware of our shared history. Sharing with my people. Back in Rome, the Inuit were finally able to talk directly with the Pope about their horrific experiences with residential schools. We want this new relationship uh, and this re relationship of reconciliation to be based on action. Former priest Johannes Revoir is just one example of a fugitive priest who escaped justice. He is wanted in Canada for a sexual assault charge relating to his time in Nunavut in the 1960s and 1970s. He fled to France shortly after, but France has no extradition agreement with Canada. Despite attempts to bring him back to face a trial, Revoir has denied the claims and France has refused to extradite him. In Rome, Powwow drummers and singers greeted the First Nations delegation after their one-on-one -on -one encounter with Pope Francis. I feel that the Pope and the Church has an expressed a sentiment of working towards reconciliation. He shared words about the shame and sorrow that the Church feels for the history concerning the unmarked graves. And just a few days after that meeting, Pope Francis addressed the general audience. Listening to your voices, I was able to enter into and be deeply grieved by the stories of the suffering, hardship, discrimination and various forms of abuse that some of you experienced, particularly in the residential schools. It's chilling. And then came the words long hoped for, but not expected. I ask for God's forgiveness, and I want to say to you with all my heart, I am very sorry. And I join my brothers, the Canadian bishops, in asking your pardon. And outside the Vatican, in St. Peter's Square, Powwow singers, dancers, and drummers performed to mark this monumental moment. For Cookby Roseanne Casimir, whose community of Tecamloos to Sequepum was the first to officially discover the 215 unmarked graves, says the apology was a major step forward in healing. It was extremely powerful to hear him be able to express sorrow, to express the shame at that level was extremely important and to provide an apology, I did not expect that today. And five months later, Pope Francis also made good on his promise to come to Canada to apologize to residential school survivors and their families on Canadian soil. And here at Musquachie's First Nation in Alberta, hundreds gathered in the arbor to greet Pope Francis as he made his way to the stage. And then came those long-awaited words everyone was waiting to hear.
I thank you for making me appreciate this, for telling me about the heavy burdens that you still bear, for sharing with me these bitter memories. Today, I am here in this land that along with, it, with its ancient memories preserves the scars of still open wounds. I am here because the first step of my penitential pilgrimage among you is that of again asking forgiveness, of telling you once more that I am deeply sorry. Sorry. <laughs> sorry for the ways in which regrettably many Christians supported the colonizing mentality of the powers that oppress the indigenous peoples. But for the many survivors gathered here, the trauma is still evident on their faces, and emotions were at an all-time high. For Sapiko, she started to sing in Cree, and the anguish was palpable. And in her language of Cree, Sapiko sang a song about the laws of the land and told the Pope that she rejected his apology. We'll talk about that apology later on in the show. Coming up, we meet with a survivor who says the trauma of residential school still haunts him to this day. The Truth and Reconciliation Commission recognized the crucial role APTN plays towards reconciliation and its calls to action. We don't take this responsibility lightly. The National Day for Truth and Reconciliation is a time to commemorate the tragic history and legacy of residential schools. And for this reason, we are airing 35 hours of special programming. Thank you for watching APTN. Tse Oleuni.
With every story of survival, there is always a small child at the center. With the Pope's visit playing out on an international stage, individual stories emerged, opening up long healed wounds. For Sam George, it was a boy named Charlie. It's been a few years since Sam George came to this cemetery located on the Squamish Nation in North Vancouver, BC. He's here to come pay his respects to a little boy that he knew from residential school named Charlie Lucas. Today he's brought Charlie a candy bar and to honor a little boy that meant so much to him. Well, Charlie would have been probably in your 70s now. <laughs> probably would have been about 70 years old. Grandkids. Children. Maybe even great-grandchildren. But you're happy where you're at now. You lived a good short life. So I'll always remember you. Sam George is now 78 years old, but in 1952, he along with other Indigenous kids were taken to St. Paul's Residential School, located not far from the cemetery. He remembers the first day that he first met little Charlie. And there was about four or five of us playing, and I looked up and I seen this little boy standing there, and he, it was his first day of school. He had this American sailor outfit on, if you can imagine that. You know, the little white sailor hat. And I said, oh, look. And we all went running there, and I was the first one there. And he was just standing there. And we all surrounded him, and just a cute little three, four-year-old guy. And uh, because I was the first guy there, the nun said, number three, or I don't know if she called me by my number, or, which was un not unusual. She said, this is Charlie, you take care of him. And so, you know, like, I took care of Charlie. He was just like, my, everybody called him my little puppy. <laughs> Everywhere I went, he was right behind me. But, you know, I was tied his shoes and everything. And I think he knew how to do all that, but... He enjoyed it, you know, and uh, when we took a shower and everything, I had to help him dress and undress and, you know, tickle his tummy and everything. And he was just like my little brother. Sam says that he loved looking after little Charlie. And then one night, everything changed. Charlie was sleeping a couple of beds away from me. And I was laying there and I heard him crying. And I got, I got up and looked, he was sitting there, he was holding his head and he was crying. And I went over and I sat beside him, I said, what's wrong, Charlie? He said, my head hurts. You know, and I didn't know what to do, and I just grabbed him and I was rubbing his head and, you know, he's just a little baby, eh? And I'm rubbing him, and finally, you know, he finally went to sleep, I laid him down, and I covered him. Then I went to bed and, and I was watching him, and I fell asleep too. And when I woke up in the morning, his bed was empty. You know, the sheet, his blankets were still uncovered like he'd been sleeping there. And what happened, I don't know how it happened even. They rushed him to St. Paul's Hospital and they operated on him and they had a, his brain was swelled. And then Sam says the nuns gathered all the kids to give them an update on Charlie. Yeah, little Charlie didn't make it. They said he died on the operating table. And so they, they didn't even worry he was from, really. He had a sister there and she said, well, we came across on the boat. That's all, she, she was young too. And so they couldn't find his mother. And so we buried him down on our reserve. You know, they brought him down the church, a little casket, and, and then they buried him there. And I remember, you know, first day, first time I understood death, you know, I was watching his little coffin go in, in the ground and seeing the bigger boys putting them, fixing everything. Then they started throwing dirt on it and I started crying. 
Then we all, they marched us all back up to the school. And I was at the end of the line, I was still crying. And the nun came up to me, she said, quit your crying. He's gone now, he's in heaven, don't cry. It wasn't until years later that Sam found out what really happened to little Charlie Lucas. I just found out about maybe 10, 12 years ago, my cousin said, remember that little guy who we followed you around? I said, yeah, Charlie. He said, well, we were upstairs in the daytime. We weren't supposed to be up there. And we heard the nun coming upstairs. So we hid away in the closet. There was just maybe just enough for them to squeeze in. It was a big dresser, but they could see the top of the stairs. The nun got to the top of the stairs and she had little Charlie with her. And for whatever reason, she got to the top of the stairs and she started slapping Charlie around, punching him. And he was crying and she started shaking him. And then she threw him down the stairs. She was shaking him so much, he went flying all the way down to the bottom of the stairs. And they, you know, they were just, they witnessed all this. You know, and I really believe she got away with murder, eh? She, you know, he died because of her. Sam says Charlie changed his life, even for a short while. Pray for us. We're still here. A few of us remember you. Maybe we'll meet again and share a pair the way we did. Pray for us, Charlie. It's still unclear which community it was that Charlie Lucas was taken from to attend this residential school. Sadly, his name joins the list of the 4,120 children's names on this red banner that was shown to Pope Francis when he apologized at the Muscochee's First Nation. It's the names of the children that never made it home and died at residential school. Unfortunately, with more on Mark Graves being discovered, that number is expected to rise. Do you suffer with pain in your legs?
From the discovery of the 215 unmarked graves in Kamloops to the delegation traveling to the Vatican to meet with Pope Francis, to the historic apologies from the Holy See, we wanted to ask some of those that we've met in the last half hour about what should happen next. The people will be stood up in the best way possible by getting rid of the doctrine of discovery. It's our key issue in many of the areas we deal with, whether it's child and family, health, uh, economics, uh, education, and, and that's what's impacting us and, and holding us back from moving our people ahead and the recovery and the well-being of all of our people. But for Sam George, the Pope's apology had no impact on his life, he says. There's no way they can better my life. You know, the government is full of promises. I've never got anything from the church. I don't ask for anything. Um, I just like them to leave me alone the way they have been. They don't even know I exist, probably. And I don't even know our priest's name who lives in a rent free on our reserve. I don't have a clue who he is. And that's okay. Um, my life goes on and on. And if I want to better my life, it's up to me. And I can do it without the church, without the priest, without the bishop, without the Pope. But for hereditary chief Robert Joseph, his vision for the future is tied to forgiveness. I think all of the elements and the dimensions and the depth of the impacts of those apologies is really important. And over time, as we heal, and I'm, I'm certain that most of the survivors are gonna have the same experience I had. As we heal, we begin to acknowledge that apologies have a, an impact. And lasting For Métis National Council President Cassidy Karen. She says Canadians can play a larger role in advancing healing and reconciliation. I think there's a role for everybody to play. There's a role for the Pope himself to play. There's a role now clearly for the Canadian Conference of Catholic Bishops to play. The Pope has outlined that role for them to play, to continue to walk forward with Indigenous people, to find those ways to move reconciliation forward. But there's roles for everybody to play in reconciliation, especially Canadians. You know, this past year, conversations have been occurring where people are finding out about Canada's true history, finding out about residential schools, finding out about all of these systems that continue to harm us as Indigenous people. And now there's no, there's no excuse for, for Canadians not to know the truth. Thank you for tuning in to watch Road to Truth on this special edition of APTN National News. We honor all of those survivors and their families for having the courage to share their truths. Take care. They tried to... Good evening, I'm Dennis Ward. Welcome to APTN National News. In Ottawa, thousands came together to mark the second annual National Day for Truth and Reconciliation. It was a day to honour residential school survivors and the ones who didn't make it home. Here's Annette Francis with that story. Walk together in peace understanding and healing. The opening ceremony started with a prayer and performances 
than the spirit walk from Parliament Hill to Le Breton Flats began. Hey, yeah, hey, yeah, hey. It was a somber event. Thousands made the two kilometer walk wearing orange shirts. 24 year old Naomi Palche says it was an emotional experience. The whole time I was thinking about the children who are being found, the ones still not found, um, you know, the survivors that didn't come home. I was also thinking about um, you know, our homeless population and like our in, um, Indigenous individuals who are suffering with addictions, um, mental health issues. For residential school survivor Joshua Frog, there was a sense of healing. I was thinking uh, that uh, I, I survived and I'm, and I'm here today and I'm walking with my daughter and she was drumming, drumming and singing. The, the very things that they tried to take away from us, she was doing it. I was so proud. I was just crying along the way. His daughter, Janine, agrees. Um, it was really emotional too for me, um, but it was really empowering at the same time because knowing the things that my dad went through and our family has gone through, the things that we're still going through is still impacting us really strongly. And right today we're able to really rise above that. It was a tearful time for Bruce Cayuda as well. I got to sing some songs in Inuk um, One of our members uh, was holding a drum and I got to sing and we got to sing and drum together. And to see all the names of the children was uh, overwhelming and I, there, was, there were tears. With the day and events coming to an end, most here agree healing and reconciliation must continue day to day. And at Francis APTN National News, Ottawa. Former Assiniboia Residential School is the only standing residential school in Winnipeg. And former students wanted to honor the grounds by creating a gathering space. Daryl Stranger joins us now at the unveiling of the space that's been years in the making. I'm here at the site of the Assiniboia Residential School in Winnipeg, Manitoba. Now today there was a commemorative monument and gathering place unveiled as you can see behind me. Now there was a good crowd today listening to plenty of survivors share their stories of their experience at residential school and what it means to them to be here today. Now one interesting and, and unique thing from today was that an elder was able to give us permission to film a pipe ceremony which normally we do not get the chance to do and uh, the elder said it was for educational purposes so that was quite a unique thing for us to be able to do and, and uh, you know it was really humbling to be able to do that as media to be able to film such an important um, event. As our original people we move forward with our healing because there's nothing else we can do but move forward and heal ourselves heal one another. Now the sacred fire that's burning here today and the commemorative monument and gathering place was in memory of Ted Fontaine and it was his vision that he wanted a place like this for survivors to gather and for and to educate excuse me the general public on just what it was like to to be at a residential school and there were names on on the ground as well that was also his vision to have the names of those students who attended residential school here now this is phase one of a more broader project to commemorate survivors and those who did not make it home from a Cinnaboy Residential School. Daryl Stranger, APTN National News, Winnipeg. Thanks, Daryl. To Alberta now. About 200 people gathered for a walk for elders who then made their way through the town of Stony Plain to honor Truth and Reconciliation Day. Chris Stewart was there. There were orange shirts everywhere in the town of Stony Plain, Alberta, 30 minutes west of Edmonton. The walk with elders was held to honor those who died too young and to move forward with truth and reconciliation. The walk was led by Cree elder, Philip Campio. He told APTN what today means to him. Today means to be proud. It means that uh, we're honoring truth and reconciliation. We're honoring the day that the government decided to declare it a holiday. We don't call it a holiday. We just call it a day of celebration that it's time to bring out the truth. It's time to reconcile about what, what happened in the past. He says ancestors are here in spirit today. Our ancestors are guiding us, are helping us, bringing people together, 
in a good way that we move forward because how, how can we move forward without not knowing the truth? Campio says no one expected this many people to participate. It's a blessing to see so many young people here. It's a blessing to see so many people. I'm overwhelmed with it. I just can't get over how many people are here today to join us in this walk. And that, it, it warms my heart. Chris Stewart, APTN National News, Stony Plain, Alberta. Now to Vancouver, where there were many events to commemorate the National Day of Truth and Reconciliation. APTN's Tina House joins us from East Vancouver. We're here at Grandview Park in East Vancouver, and joining me today is Mally Katla. Mally Katla, always nice to see you. Thank you, and it's always good to be with you, and also to see what is happening here today. It's a, it's a really wonderful uh, day and a real strong outpouring of uh, the beginning of understanding for everyone of uh, every child matters and I believe that the more people that we have participating on a day like today uh, the more progress that we will make toward the goals that we have set for uh, truth and reconciliation to really and truly begin to take place. Absolutely. Melly Kelly, would you share with us a little bit of your story and what school that you went to? Oh, thank you. Um, uh, the school that I went to is uh, St. Mary's Indian Residential School in Mission. I went to that, that uh, concentration camp. They called a school from 1947 to 1952. The thing that I remember the most is to be cold. I was always cold the whole five years that I was there and being hungry because uh, Mission uh, had a systemic um, uh, a scientific experiment of starvation diet. Aside from uh, the fact of being removed from my family, I had to come from a very loving uh, home and village. Uh, it was uh, the singular worst uh, experience uh, of my life and I've spent a lifetime of uh, overcoming it. Across the Northwest Territory, celebrations were taking place in Nunavik, Talita, Fort Simpson, and many more communities. In Yellowknife, folks, young and old, showed up in their orange with the message, Every Child Matters. Here's a look at that event. Charlotte Moore Jacobs reporting from Sambake Yellowknife in Denaday. A crowd is gathering for the second annual National Day for Truth and Reconciliation. Behind me, a prayer song will open today's events along with speeches from survivors, elders, and Indigenous leaders. A little later on, the Yellow Knives Dene will host a feeding of the fire ceremony along with a feast and a drum dance and stories from residential school survivors and intergenerational survivors. Canada's plan was to turn the Indian child into a white person, a real Canadian, with your hair cut, hair taken off, your tattoos probably disappeared, and that was the real plan, Canada's real plan. But it didn't work out that way because I have to thank all those who speak, spoke out about what's going to happen. And those are the real heroes. Kaluit residents gathered today in the middle of the community to mark September 30th. For a wet day, they got a full crowd. Our Kent Driscoll was there. A crowd of hundreds took to the streets in Kaluit to mark Truth and Reconciliation Day. Nunavut's population, 85% of the people are Inuit. That means a day recognizing what happened to residential school students hits hard here. It happened to so many. Jack Anawak is a residential school survivor and led the marchers today. For him, it isn't just the history. It's what remembering that history can do for Inuit today. It's very important that we recognize the need for more mental health uh, programs and escalate the uh, mental health programs as much as possible over, the, over all of Canada, really. Eva Ariak has worn many public service hats in her long career. Current Commissioner of Nunavut, former Premier, former Language Commissioner. 
matter. She thinks this is a time for everyone to take totally notice supporting this and here. think. And it's so wonderful to see so many people coming out here in the time of day to listen and to learn all across Canada. Uh, that includes us up here in the Arctic as well. Nunavut's Premier was on hand to mark the occasion. Here he is with Nunavut Senator Dennis Patterson. Patterson's on the right in the sealskin jacket. He has hope that this event can help in the big picture of reconciliation. Uh, it's a very important gathering uh, right across the territory. I think really reconciliation uh, is really has been something where uh, Indigenous people are looking for action and gatherings like this allow us to be able to reflect, reflect back uh, in terms of uh, the, the struggles Indigenous people face and really where we go from here. This is the second year in a row that Iqaluit residents have marched on September 30th. With such a large, and by Iqaluit standards, turnout, it's pretty easy to see this event continuing on for years to come. Kent Driscoll, APTN National News, Iqaluit. <laughs> Thanks, Kent. And that is all the time we have for this shortened edition of APTN National News. That's because an encore presentation of Remembering the Children, a commemorative event that was held in Ottawa earlier today, is up next. You can find all of our coverage of this National Day for Truth and Reconciliation on our website. That's aptnnews.ca. I'm Dennis Ward. Thanks for being with us today. Have a great night.